Hi, I'm Brian Russell. Welcome back to class. Today I want to go over with you the survey that you completed on Matthew 1, 18 to 223. Now I do invite you to go ahead and open up your scriptures because it's critical when we go over the survey that you have your Bible open and also have your own survey. And what we'll find is hopefully some broad agreement. Again, you're not being graded or asked to develop surveys that are exactly like mine. So you need to watch this with uh, a sense of, I'm hoping that you can follow what I do. And essentially that's what you got to do at this point in the semester. If you can follow what I'm doing in my work, then you're okay. It's also important that you write down questions. What questions do you have after, as you watch this video, how can I clarify things for you? And then make sure that you post them within the class forms. We can even ask them as questions, uh, on, as comments to this video. Again, let's talk about survey. And again, the steps to survey, at least for a, a segment, is to give a brief title to each paragraph so that you can think through the contents of the passage. The idea, again, being that you can without recourse to having your Bible open, that you can think through the, the way the text goes. Because sometimes when you're taking a walk or maybe taking a shower or even sleeping, you may wake up with an idea about how the passage fits together because you're able to think it through by virtue of having these titles that allow you to remember what's in each paragraph. Also, the second step then is then to locate main units and subunits. Again, two to four main units, each with two to four subunits. You may have more than four, but just make sure that you justify them. And I would also suggest that you write a couple of sentences once you've found your main units and subunits to justify your divisions. That will help to clarify in your mind why it is you think that the main units are in these locations. And then you look for structures. And again, you may find structures first and then find the units, but you want to find the major structures that connect your main units or control 50% of the material. Then you want to ask a few interpretive questions. So you're going to ask a definitional, a rational, and an implicational question for each of your structures. Now, Make sure at this point in the term that you have the structure sheet in front of you, the worksheet that lists all the structures that has sample questions because that allows you to, again, work through the process without demanding of yourself to have memorized everything. Memorization and fluidity and to be able to, use, to do this without any sheets or worksheets will come with time. But for now, make sure you have the resources that you need to work well. Then for each structure that you've located, you're going to ask a set of questions. You're also going to make sure that you identify a key verses or strategic areas. These are smaller sections of the whole that give you insight to the whole segment and make sure that you link these to a structure. It's a, a passage is not strategic or a key just because you think it should be. It needs to be part of one of your major structures. So you want to think of a strategic area as that smaller portion of the text that best represents your structure and each structure should be represented in a strategic area. Though you may have several structures represented by one by the same strategic area. Then identify the literary form, whether it's a prose narrative, a poetry, um, ideological material, uh, the different uh, uh, options that we have. Then write and describe the segment, the atmosphere. So give a few words that lay out the atmosphere and then note any other major impressions that you have. Now again, we're going to dr jump directly to looking at Matthew 1, 18 to 23, or 1, 18 to 2, 23. If you haven't read it for a while, I invite you to stop the video, read through the passage, review your survey, and then I will show you what, how, uh, what I did with this text. All right, let's go over the survey. You can see my titles for the materials. I just called it Angels and Joseph, Wise Guys Arrive, Wise Guys Worship, Joseph Jesus in Egypt, Herod Kills, Joseph Jesus and Jesus in Nazareth, 219 to 23. Now, let me show you my main units. And you may have broken this up differently, 
I essentially broke it up into two pieces based on what we have. We essentially have a story about Jesus' birth, and then we have story about Jesus sometime after his birth. And I bro uh, then I have two units, 118 to 25, and then 21 to 23. And you can look at that. I broke it up into subunits. What I'm going you're going to see here in a few minutes is that this first line, I consider this the general statement for the entire segment from 118B all the way to 223, but I, I went ahead and included it in this uh, first section. Again, the difference being we essentially, uh, is we have the role of Joseph rolls through this entire passage, but essentially we have um, the G, the Circumstances leading to Jesus' birth, and then the circumstances after Jesus' birth. Now, structures. What are the structures that we can identify? Well, the first structure, and I, I see it at, in parallel with 1-1, one, one, which was the initial passage in Matthew's Gospel. 118a is, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way. And so we have the birth of Jesus the Messiah, and I know that this happens by alternating what takes place with an interchange and kind of a chiasm in a way as well. Let me show you what I mean. So the general statement is this opening line, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way, or the circumstances of the birth, the genesis, the beginnings of Jesus. The particulars are... And I use a chiasm, if you remember, it goes in uh, A, B, A, B, A, or you can call this kind of an interchange, probably more properly chiasm here, is we have Joseph, 118 to 20, B to 25. Then we have the story of Herod and the Magi, 2, 1 to 12. Then we have Joseph fleeing from Bethlehem to Egypt. Then we have Herod and the Magi, um, and Herod going to Bethlehem and murdering folks. And again, notice that the action here is in Jerusalem. The Magi go to Bethlehem, and then Herod goes to Bethlehem for murder. And then the segment ends with Joseph then coming back out of Egypt and going to Nazareth. So that would be a, a way of calling the particularization. Again, the idea being in 118, the word that some of our English translations have is birth, maybe better being the beginnings of Jesus the Messiah. And the particulars would then be these elements, which again highlight the role that Joseph plays in Jesus' earliest days. So some of the questions that I ask, what is the precise and specific meaning of the general statement, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way? That's a definitional question. What is the meaning of birth, that Greek word genesis? What is involved in the particulars? Those, are, those all are definitional questions, and I ask a rational question. Why does Matthew shape this section through particularization? Why the use of interchange, chiasm? What are the implications? And I said the strategic area would be 118a. That's the general statement. Now, a second possible structure would be a recurrence of revelation. And I'm also noting the element of comparison that's here because what drives the story or forward, what's consistent throughout the entire segment are the use of various types of revelation, including dreams. And I have those recorded there, multiple dreams, the Joseph and the Magi. The star shows up. The star is a source of revelation, which is quite interesting. And then we have scripture, and I list out the different scriptures that we have here that are said to be fulfilled. So we have um, scripture, the star, and dreams functioning in a revelatory way with implicit note that they're, these are all being compared. These are ways that people discover the ways of God. Again, then you, I have the questions noted here. You can take a look at them. Again, note that I have definitional questions, several of them. Then I have a couple of rational questions, then an implicational question. And for the strategic area, I listed 2, 1 to 12 because you find all three elements there in those verses. Now, you might ask, is that kind of large for a strategic area? 
uh, perhaps, but this is a big segment, and I would suggest if you drill down in these 12 verses, you would have a great place to out from which to interpret the entire segment. Instrumentation. Instrumentation, if you remember, is a means to an end, and this is related to this particular structure. And in fact, I could have made a compound structure recurrence of revelation with instrumentation or instrumentation by recurrence of revelation. And if you see here, the means are dreams, scripture, star, and the result of that, the end of that, is that the dreams drive action, including positive by the Joseph and the Magi. God gives them instructions and Joseph and the Magi follow them. The scriptures have a positive effect on the Magi, uh, but negative effect on Herod. Um, and they explain what's happening. And in those cases, they give a purpose, right? So it's all these things happen so that scripture could be fulfilled. And then the star certainly drives the positive actions of the Magi. Uh, again, questions, what is the precise and specific meaning of the agents? Uh, dream, scripture, star, how are they the same? How are they different? So notice th that's implicitly suggesting that there's some elements of comparison and contrast there. What is the means of the ends, actions, or the purpose statements with all scriptures except Micah 5.5? 5, 5? Why this use of instrumentation and what are the implications? And the strategic area for here, I'm suggesting, would be 1, 20 to 25, where Joseph responds to a dream, and the angel uses Isaiah 9 to explain. Okay, then we have a recurrence of biographical contrast. I simply use the word biographical here in case you're wondering to, to be specific that what's being contrasted here are persons. And so it's interesting that there's elements of comparison here too. So we have the insider... And the outsider, Joseph and the Magi, are held together over against Herod, the outsider, and all Jerusalem, the insiders. And the interesting thing here is that the major characters in this story contrast with each other in terms of the response to the revelation about the birth of Jesus the Messiah. The Joseph and Magi respond positively, Herod, all Jerusalem, negatively. By the way... That phrase, all Jerusalem, we understand why Herod, Herod would be troubled, but isn't it interesting that God's people are troubled by the appearance of Jesus, their Messiah? That's going to be an interesting theme that we'll see through the entire book of Matthew, that outsiders, insiders alike can be troubled or can respond positively to Jesus. And you can take a look at the questions that I have listed here. Again, notice definitional, then we have a rational question, a couple of them, followed lastly by an implicational question, with the strategic area again being 2, 1 to 12 for that. Okay, there's an introduction as well, and the introduction is 1b to 25. Those verses serve, as, uh, serve to introduce this entire segment. They establish the holy family of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Joseph becomes the father of Jesus. You may have re remembered that in the genealogy, Joseph really isn't the father of Jesus. Uh, so you want to know, how is it that Joseph is Jesus' father? Well, he becomes the father of Jesus here when he names him. So he essentially is adopting Jesus. We also note that, this, that, God is con that God is controlling the way history is unfolding through the revelation, through the angel, through scripture. And we see the importance of obedience to revelation. Again, asking questions, and the strategic area would be 18b to 25. And this, this is a typo here. This should be 118b to 25. Then last structure, it would, I would suggest the climax. 219 to 23 serves as a climax to this unit. By means of revelation, God guides the family from Egypt to safety in, the, in Nazareth of Galilee. This reality fulfills Old Testament scripture. Again, ask questions, and the strategic area would be the climactic passage. Now, the literary form, this is clearly prose narrative, atmosphere, it's tense, it's suspenseful uh, from the be beginning when the, the angel appears to Joseph or all of the drama that's behind Jesus' birth and the upsetness of Herod, the appearance of the Magi, and Joseph's flight to Egypt. Very tense, very suspenseful. Contrast strongly, you might note, with the 
joyful texts and narratives about Jesus' birth that show up in Luke's gospel. Now, miscellaneous observation. They make a few things. Joseph seems to be the only character that changes in response to Revelation. He was going to divorce Mary and instead fully embraces Mary and her child post-appearance of angels. We have an interesting use of insiders and outsiders, and that's going to be a key theme. And then how scandalous for Matthew's audience was the use of magi, these foreigners as heroes. Really, these are in the magi were in fact probably astrologers. So it's like it invites us to imagine what would have been like for astrologers to show up with actual insight into what God was doing. Kind of like some of these women that we saw last week that showed up in the genealogy that showed that around the Messiah's birth, there could be some unusual circumstances. Okay, that's the survey. Uh, what questions do you have? Do you have questions about the way I describe things? Do you have questions about your own work now? Do you have questions about inductive Bible study method? Whatever they are, go ahead, go into the forums and raise them. Also, you can tell me what you liked about the survey. If you have any other questions, let me know. I'm Brian Russell, and it's my privilege to serve as your professor this, uh, this semester.